it's a real pleasure to come and talk to this group. Um, I enjoyed the virtual launch very much indeed. And I'm going to be returning to the image that I spoke about then very, very briefly because there are more stories to tell there. I just wanted to say how I came to be involved in the project. Um, I've been working for many years now with Nigel Leask, who of course is one of the key organizers of the exhibition, Old Ways and New Roads. And that work came partly out of the project that we've been running together for several years now called Curious Travellers, which was looking at how tours of Wales and Scotland really opened up those countries in new and interesting ways and brought together some of the extraordinary images which you will see in your exhibition online and which are also part of the wonderful book that's come out of the, the exhibition. And a key figure for us was Thomas Pennant, who of course traveled in Scotland in 1769 and 1772. Um, what we did with our research team was start to pull together some of the correspondence and some of the writings that were to do with those tours of Wales and Scotland that he made in the 1760s and 1770s. And if you visit our Curious Travellers website, you can see how far we've got so far. But what I want to do today is to suggest that really we're just beginning and we would love to be able to keep going with this work um, in, as a collaborative team in the future. And I feel very much that Old Ways and New Roads is, is part of this whole exciting new research into travel writing in the 18th century. This thing, this beautiful, beautiful book, is Pennant's own coffee table version of his own tours of Wales. No expense spared. His very own artist, Moses Griffith, asked to decorate the text of his published book. So he had these printed specially with wide margins and interleaved um, pages. And as you can see, the effect is very much like a medieval manuscript, little vignettes, bits of antiquity, uh, scenes, buildings. And these are all absolutely unique sort of windows onto 18th century Wales in this case. Pennant's influence on tour writing in general, this is a slide I've used many times, but I just wanted to show you how Pennant's writings actually shaped the way people perceived landscape and the way they thought and wrote about it in their own works. And here we have three travellers coming after Pennant to look at the well at Hollywell. And you see in Pennant's language, when he talks about the spring springing out of the well, he speaks of the vast impetuosity of this spring in its beautiful polygonal well. Pretty well everybody who follows him cannot resist using those words, profusion and impetuosity, incredible impetuosity, vast impetuosity. So Pennant is actually shaping the language that people use to describe things they are experiencing for themselves. I find that very interesting. And I think that the combination of bringing together images and text allows us to explore 18th century travel writing in some really interesting new ways. Now Pennant didn't produce quite the same sort of coffee table versions of his tours of Scotland, but he did do extra illustration. He had big editions printed of the 1769 and 72 tours and into them he's interleaved the paintings and sketches that his artist Moses Griffith did on the ground. These have never been published and really what we want to do as a next step um, uh, with the Curious Travellers Project is to produce digital editions of the tours of Wales and Scotland which would allow you to visit Inverary in the text, click on the word Inverary and then jump into this amazing picture by Moses Griffith, which you could then unpick by clicking on different parts of it using IIIF, which is a, a form of digitization that allows you to annotate pictures, to explain what's going on, to tell the stories of those pictures. Very much in the way that John Bonehill did last week with that beautiful Sambi painting. He unpacked a whole history, didn't he, out of that picture. So here we have um, an image of Inverary, which will have been sketched by Moses Griffith and Pennant and the crew as they were sitting there 
opposite on the waters as they traveled through. Here are a few more just taken at random from between the leaves of those Scottish tours. And you can see that Pennant's interests encompassed many different types of information. So Moses was asked to draw botanical specimens. And one product of the tour of Scotland in 72 was John Lightfoot's Flora Scoticum. And he and Moses together worked to catalogue and make pictures of the specimens that they gathered up hillsides, um, in valleys, by streams, as they made their way around Scotland on this extraordinarily um, groundbreaking Scottish tour. On the right hand side, you see the image of the whiskey hut um, with various people outside meeting to greet them. So little, little vignettes of social life as well in these tours. And again, these are images which have either, ha have not actually been pulled into a textual edition of the tours in Wales. In the center, one of my favorite pictures and a real find that we were all extremely excited about when we, we started looking at the Scottish tours with their extra illustrations. This lovely picture of John Stewart of Killen uh, writing a letter, which again is, is very appropriate. Stewart um, was a great scholar, a botanist, um, a theologian, a translator, and he accompanied Pennant on that 72 tour of the Highlands and brought an enormous amount of knowledge and information. And John Stewart's letters have become part of the correspondence that our team, particularly Alex Deans and Nigel Lees, have edited as part of the Curious Travellers website. So if you go in to the website and search for John Stewart, you'll be able to find the letters that he and Pennant exchanged, which allowed Pennant to write more in depth um, with more information about the places that he'd passed through on his journey. Letters then are another way that we can enrich the text of, a, of a, an 18th century tour. So a digital edition could open you out onto these lovely images, but it could also give you access directly to the letter that lies behind a particular paragraph in the tour. And what that gives you the chance to do is to see how Pennant's writing is very composite, how it's formed of the voices of other people, and it gives voice to those other people. And so very often travel writing is seen as a way of imposing one version of reality on a, a muted and silent population. But actually Pennant's way of working was very collaborative and he used a lot of native speakers and native ministers to send information in. So you get quite interesting things going on from different cultural perspectives. This then was the image which I chose to talk about in the launch and it takes us back to Thomas Pennant's hometown of Hollywell where his uh, estate at Downing was. And this is not by Moses Griffiths, who did many of his paintings. It's by a man called John Ingleby, whom he also commissioned to do illustrations for these beautiful extra illustrated tours. Anyone who's ever been to St. Winifred's Well will know that this captures the extraordinary beauty and intricacy of the architecture of that medieval shrine, where the waters still well up with impetuosity and are still visited today by pilgrims and travellers. And there's so much going on in this picture. I know I talked a little bit about it before, but my next few slides are just going to take you around little parts of it. Um, up on the left there, you see the attendant hanging a towel for people who have bathed. And we can see, we'll come to see one of them in a moment. Here we see the beau monde having a drink of the health-giving waters of St. Winifred. Um, the maid, the, the attendant is bringing a glass to them and they're pointing at that impetuous well that you can see there. The lady actually looks as if she has mumps. Um, and I'm not sure whether the little dog belongs to the shrine or to them, but uh, he's, he's a nice addition. This shivering creature in his underwear has just come out of a dipping in the holy well and he's presumably going to be feeling the benefit before long. 
behind you can see a well-dressed couple pointing out the architecture of the well, but look what's behind them, a water wheel. And that water wheel turns a mill, probably a cotton, cotton mill or a paper mill or the wire um, copper, which is further down the valley. This shrine sits at the top of a little valley and the stream of St Winifred, the sacred stream, drives a whole series of factories right down to the sea. And there's some beautiful ironies here because people visiting the well commented on its superstitious, Catholic, medieval qualities and were a little bit kind of horrified sometimes by the, the, the sort of um, the credulity on view. For them, the fact that the stream drove the mills of progress was a good thing. It was a sign that we were moving in the right direction and that all this industry somehow cleansed the spirit of superstition and that the, the work being done in the mills was infinitely better to the kind of beggary that you see up in the, the, um, the well itself. Looked at from a 20th century, 21st century perspective, the ironies multiply, of course, because those mills down the valley, paper mills where cotton mills, where young children worked day and night, copper mills, where they actually made the pots and pans and the manilas, which were used in exchange in North Africa for slaves. And many of those slaves ended up in Brazil where they worked on cotton plantations to create the raw cotton, which came back in bales to Liverpool and was then sent up to Holywell Mill to be turned into cotton threads in an amazing triangle of progress, which Brit takes in the whole of the world and shows the incredibly exploitative nature of our proto-capitalist society. So there are these interesting and fascinating balances between where that water flows, what that water does, and whether that water is a healing, um, positive and impetuous force and a beautiful thing, and what its kind of side effects are. Homing in on these two then, we see an elderly woman in Welsh costume um, with a big floppy wide hat and the blue gown. Uh, perhaps she's there to beg a few pennies, perhaps she's just come to look at this other character who is in a much worse state, as you can see. Um, one of the benefits of working with this triple IF formula is that it allows you to zoom in to these images with the kind of the kind of magnitude that normally only art historians get a real chance to do in museums and in galleries, you know, with the proper equipment. It's an amazing resource that allows you to really home in on what's going on in a picture. And when I looked at this picture in the past, I'd always just thought, ah, oh, yeah, the poor beggar in the corner lined up there with his wooden leg, his cap out. And I'd worked quite a lot on the narrative of the, the, the slave trade at the bottom of the valley and the way that everybody is sort of implicated in that. And it was only when I came to look at this really through the IIIF function that I started to look more at the face of this man. And I don't know about you and I, I'm no art historian and certainly John Ingleby has no other character like this in his entire corpus that I can find. But could that, sorry, could that face be the face of a black man? And if so, would that not make this the most extraordinary picture where the hidden cost of the stream is actually revealed? Um, this is something that I am on no certain ground about, and I do not know a lot about the representation of black people in 18th century landscape painting, but it really, if you look at his hands and his face, it doesn't seem impossible that this person is indeed black, which would compound the irony and suggest that, you know, the horror of what happens down the stream is actually there in full view. And that's really the story that I wanted to share with you today. 
Um, my final um, picture takes us back then to the possibilities of creating a digital edition, which uh, reflects, I think, the, the sort of multiplicity of Pennant's own interest in uh, the visual, the antiquarian, the botanical, the historical, and just the general kind of multifariousness of the worlds that he walked and rode through with his um, companions. And I'd just leave you with this very rich image from the Welsh tours of um, Norfolk, which is pretty well close to, to where he is as well, and Trislam at the bottom there. So those are just a few thoughts that have come out of um, our work on uh, the Curious Travellers. And I'd be very happy to share ideas and questions with any of you.